Have you ever wondered why robots don't get cancer? After this conversation, you will. In this conversation, I had the privilege to speak with Dr. Michael Levine, one of the most innovative and fascinating biologists I've ever met. Dr. Michael Levine is a professor at Tufts University and an expert in the field of developmental biology and regenerative medicine. Throughout our conversation, we discuss his groundbreaking research, including the role and notion of bioelectricity. What is it and why it is so profoundly important both to biology and medicine? His theories about the self and free will are mind-blowing. And some of the things we discuss today sound like science fiction. But let me assure you one thing, they are not. They are true science backed up with great results. Hi and welcome to my channel. My name is Dr. Roy Yosevich. In this channel, I converse with the most interesting and influential people from all around the world, discussing science, biology, artificial intelligence, and more. If you find this talk interesting, please consider subscribing, hit the bell button, and be part of this great community. And now, without further ado, Professor Michael Levine. Okay, one, two, three. Hi, Michael, and thank you so much for being on the show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we start, since I see this shirt over and over again in many <laughs> interviews, could we, tell, could we tell us what are we seeing in, on the shirt? It's just a normal bee or there is something? It, it's not a normal bee. Well, this is the uh, Diverse Intelligence uh, Summer Institute. And this is um, a student named Brenda uh, made this, uh, this T-shirt for a uh, community of, uh, it's, actually, it's quite an amazing a uh, community of people who uh, gather to study what we call diverse intelligence, which is intelligence in unfamiliar embodiments. And so this is a kind of, a, you can see it's a kind of chimeric bee, right? It's a little robotic and a little, and so these these are the kinds of things that I'm uh, I'm very interested in, is uh, novel, novel ways that mind enter the physical world. You know, I wrote a book about intelligence in Hebrew. It's called Intelligence, the Unpleasant Truth. Mm. But uh, listening to you, you, you had another a definition, a, J, a James a Watson, I think, definition of intelligence is the idea to pursue the same goal by different, from different perspective. Could you please elaborate on this definition of intelligence? Sure. Um, well, there are, of course, many definitions of intelligence, and I'm not claiming this is the only one, but uh, one that I like as being useful for research is one uh, that was um, really used by William James, the psychologist and philosopher. And his definition is the ability to achieve the same goal by different means. And so I like this very much because, first of all, it doesn't say anything about what kind of brain you have or how, where you came from or um, any of these very specific things. It uh, tries to understand what is common to all intelligent beings. And I think that what is common to all uh, agents, uh, no matter what they're made of, no matter the evolved, designed, uh, whatever, is the ability to pursue goals with different degrees of competency. How clever are you? And somebody, somebody uh, had this great quote, and I wish I used it all the time, and I wish I could remember who said it. He said, it's the difference between two magnets trying to come together and Romeo and Juliet trying to come together, right? You see that, that in between there's a spectrum of how, how much cleverness can you uh, expect when you put a barrier in, in, the, in this process? minimal for the magnets and quite considerable <laughs> for Romeo and Juliet. So that's the, that's the idea. Oh, this is great. By the way, the magnets do come together eventually, but uh, this is another story. <laughs> uh, you keep mentioning in your interviews, and I, uh, and I listen to many of them with, uh, as a preparation, the books that you read when you were 17, The Body Electric, Electromagnetism, and The Foundation of Life. And this is a book by Robert Baker. And when you speak about the book, you said, listen, I, I read it when I was 17. And it's like, it, 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 this is the origin of me seeking for, you know, bioelectricity. Could you please elaborate more on this book and the influence that it had on you? Because just one book at age of 17 just paved the way to you <laughs> as a, researcher. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll take a slight step backwards and say that um, my, my fundamental interest, which I've had long before that, since I was quite a little kid, is really in uh, the, the, the way that mind exists in the physical world. 
Okay, I wanted to know uh, what what it is that makes uh, engineer engineering different from biology, or what they have in common, and how it is that uh, creatures made of physical things can have preferences, goals, uh, you know, um, uh, behaviors, and so on. Um, bioelectricity is one way in which here on Earth we can see uh, the scaling of goals from little tiny goals that individual cells have to very large goals that organs and then and then of course whole bodies have. So bioelectricity is very important, but it's just one uh, it's one particular way that that happens. Um, and there were actually several books. Um, the very first book that I encountered on this was uh, was a book by William uh, by um, uh, H. S. Burr, Harold Saxton Burr, and this this guy worked in the 1930s and 40s. He basically had uh, the first good voltmeter, and he went around measuring everything: uh, plants, uh, rabbits, uh, tumors, uh, patients, and psychiatric institutions. Everything he could manage. And on the basis of this, he wrote uh, he wrote a remarkable book. Uh, I think I think the guy had a crystal ball. He foresaw. With this very simple technique, many of the things that we've discovered since then, just amazing. But um, and so and so this made a huge impression on me, but not until I saw Becker's book did I understand that there was actually a considerable body of work after Burr. Burr's book came out in, I think, 1936 or something like that. And what what's amazing about uh, the body electric, which is Robert Becker's book, is that he talks about a lot of the people that have done work since then. So, so all the great, all the all the greats of uh, early bioelectricity, um, and on reading that book, it became obvious to me that this was an actual field that could be pursued now. You know, um, now now also that book has half of the book is about electromagnetic dangers of uh, field exposures and things like this, and I'm not really into that. I think that doesn't actually have anything to do with bioelectricity. I think that was kind of a a, a red herring, really. But 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 the part where he goes over how it is that electricity uh, is the basis of uh, embryonic development, regeneration, cancer, Th this, this really, you know, kind of put me on the path that that's a, that's an entry point to studying the things I really want to study. Okay. So we must, I think, go from there to uh, uh, your interview with Chris from, uh, from Ted, we have the notion of DNA as being the building blocks of everything human or everything that is alive, basically. And the idea is that you have this A, G, C, T, the sequence, a big sequence of A, of DNA. And with this sequence, you can build everything. This is like the hardwire hardware of everything alive. And then after the concept of uh, DNA, of, of genes, we have the concept of epigenetics. The idea is that some genes can be activated or turned on and off in certain scenarios but then that you go beyond or above this level and say listen we have another level of complexity or flexibility which is bioelectricity the idea is that cells that the human cells or the just cells communicate and can modify themselves according to scenarios or the environment with electrical signal is it true or uh, um, Am I saying it right? You're saying it right, but I want to draw a stronger distinction between bioelectricity and, and genetics and epigenetics uh, on, on the one hand and bioelectricity and physiology more generally on the other. The big difference is, is this. Uh, it, it isn't, I, I think, it isn't just another layer of complexity or another set of physical events that you have to understand in addition to your chemistry and things like that. There's a, there's a really fundamental distinction here. Um, uh, and let's, let's look at two, two pieces. W one piece is, if we ask, what is encoded by these various uh, layers? So if you look at the genome, what you see encoded are protein sequences. When we, we can read genomes now, and it's been clear for, for many, many decades that what's in the genome are not things about whether you have eyes and how many eyes and where, where they're located relative to your feet and how many toes you have. None of this is directly in the genome. When you look at the genome, what you see is specification of proteins, little tiny um, hardware components that every cell gets to have. So <clears throat> I'm going to make the analogy, and there are places where this analogy breaks down, and there are other places where this is a good analogy. I'm going to make an analogy to a computer because it's familiar to everybody. What the, what the genome does is define the lowest level components in your computer. So it will define things like the silicon, the, you know, the, 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 the transistors, and, and this kind of thing. It, it defines the very lowest 
hardware level. And then you have a different uh, question. You have, okay, that's that's nice. That, that tells us about the hardware. But now I see this thing running some sort of program and doing some sort of things that may be very simple. It may be quite intelligent. Maybe it's running in GPT-3. Who knows what, it, what it's running? Uh, how do I explain this by reference to what's in the hardware? And we know that the hardware is essential. Without the hardware, nothing happens. But we also know that most people who operate computers don't do it with a soldering iron. And so you ask this question, why not? Why do we not do what we did in the 40s and 50s? And if you see a picture of somebody programming a computer in those days, what are they doing? They're pulling wires, right? They're, 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 they're connecting wires in and out. And this is because, uh, yes, you can interface with this thing at the bare metal, at the lowest level of the hardware. But what we learn from computer science is that there are actually much more convenient, higher levels of organization here. And specifically, there are some things uh, known as algorithms that, that the computer, right? It's very useful to think of algorithms and to write algorithms. You know, if you're really focused, uh, I, I give you this this example. If you're 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 hiring uh, programmers, coders for your company, and somebody comes in and they say, "I'm a reductionist. I have this Laplacian view of the world where I don't believe what's this algorithm? There's no algorithm. There's electrons and there's Maxwell's de you know Maxwell's equations of the of electron motion. There's no algorithm. There's just there's just electrons, right?" would you ever hire that person for your software company? Of course not. They would never write anything. They, right? I wouldn't hire anyone who writes in assembly language. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. of course. If, 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 somebody, if somebody does not believe that there is an algorithm that makes the electrons dance to the, to the, to the logic of the algorithm, they will not, they're not, they're not wrong in the sense of physics, but there, it's a sterile view that doesn't let you make full use of the of the system that you have. Bioelectricity is the same thing. It is the software. It is the medium in which the software of life operates. And furthermore, very much like in the brain. So the other good analogy is to neuroscience. Like in the brain, what's magic about the uh, electrical dynamics of the brain is that uh, it is the medium in which the the cognitive content is kept. Right. It is if you if we understood how to decode it, and people certainly are working on neural decoding, we could we could read out the memories, the goals, the the preferences, the behavioral competencies of a creature by decoding this electrophysiology. That is exactly what electricity does in the rest of your body. It is not just another layer of complexity. After the genetics and the epigenetics and many other aspects of chemistry have had their say, and they determine what the hardware is. Now you have this physiology, this real-time physiology that determines what the hardware is going to do. So let me just recap and uh, make the distinction about how the software. I thought, and apparently I was wrong, that my sequence, 3 billion AGCT sequence, determines who am I. So I, can t I could take this 3 billion sequence, go to the laboratory and say, please duplicate me. But you say, as I understand, there is nothing in this sequence that tells me, listen, this is a human being. This is a human body. The eyes should be here. The mouth should be here. Is it true? Um, let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, this is a subtle question. So let's d d distinguish a couple of things here. Um, it, it definitely does not say who you are. So if we were to copy your DNA, we could clone you from your DNA. We like would Dolly. Get Sure. We, yep, exactly. We would get another body that is fairly similar to your body. Uh, when you say it will be you, the, um, the, 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 the adult physiology, the, the memories, the behavior, none of that will be determined in the same way as we tend to think. As, as, as we tend to think. So, so all of that is really um, uh, due to uh, various inputs, experiences, all of the no, things. No, no, yeah, yeah. I, 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 no, no, no. I am sorry. I, I meant like a, a hardware duplication, like Dolly. But see, what I, I meant, see. you said, but you said, uh, or I thought you said, that there is nothing in this DNA, in this genome sequence that tell me, listen, this is a human body. The eyes should be here. The mouth should be here. We have two arms, two legs. So yeah, yeah, if, okay. this, if this information is not encoded into this giant AGCT sequence, where is it encoded? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um... So, so let's let's be clear. If you were to uh, duplicate, uh, clone the genetics, you you would in fact get a similar body with the same number of eyes and limbs and everything else. That's you would get. But it is not because those things are encoded in the DNA. Uh, imagine um, if I give you 
uh, the, uh, the description of a couple of transistors and how they connect together, you, can, you, you will end up with a logic gate, right? Let's say, let's say a, a NAND gate or something like that. That logic okay. gate comes with a truth table, right? And we know that it, it, operate, it does this computation, it makes this truth table. That truth table was nowhere in the description that I gave you. I gave you the description of some transistors. Where did the truth table come from? And, and nevertheless, what the, what the, so, so you have this, this very interesting thing where uh, certain kinds of machines, when they are specified with, at the hardware level, uh, make use of laws of physics, of computation, to do specific things that were never in the original description. So, so yes, you will get a human body, but what's in the what's in the instructions is the hardware that then um, uh, 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 exploits the laws of physics to do all of these amazing computations that eventually result in most of the time two eyes, ten fingers, and and all of that stuff. This is a great analogy because one can look at four at four I don't know a uh, fat transistors for one hundred years without even considering a NAND gate. Yes. The yes. idea is yes. that, okay, so there is somewhere, someone from above the system, outside the system, who can, who can make sense. I think, you know, the, the, the concept is make sense of what yes. we're seeing. Yes, yes. As, and yes. my question is, and I hope it's a legal question in, in, in your realm, who is it? Yeah, yeah. Or what is, is it? Yeah. Uh. This is, this is extremely important, and, and everything that uh, I've been working on for years now, with, and in particular with a collaborator uh, called Chris Fields, we've been developing a, a way of looking at these things that uh, is really centered on the notion of an observer. So, so all of the, everything that we talk about, so, so in, in, in behavior, intelligence, computation, physiology, mm -hmm. all of these things, all assume the presence of a particular observer who interprets events in a particular way. Now, now one key thing, and this, this goes to um, Hofstadter's notion of a, of, a, of, a, um, of a strange loop, that observer can be the system itself. So you can easily have, you don't need one sort of supernatural mega observer to observe everybody else. Systems can very easily observe and interpret themselves if they have the right degree of complexity. But all of these, n none of these things, in my opinion, are objective, um, universal truths, they are a uh, viewpoint of some observer that sees, in fact, Josh Bongard and I just wrote a paper on polycomputation where it's, 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 it starts with his amazing discovery that you can take the exact same set of events, some kind of physical medium doing something, and you can look at it from multiple perspectives and see different computations happening in the exact same piece of hardware. And so I think this is really important. You, 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 you put on a, a, onto a very important point, which is all of this is observer relative. And this is very interesting. I, I, I would ask you in your opinion, okay, maybe the system is complex enough in some level that, can, that the system can observe itself. But would you uh, also consider the system at the beginning, at the embryo level, as also complex enough? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can tell. Look, let's let's we can tell a story about metacognition in bacteria. So 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 you have a bacteria and no the no no. Just a second, just a second. I, I I want to go to the metacognition later on. Please let me. Okay, let's okay. start. Let's start with the science fiction and move on to the more science fiction. Okay, because I think everything that you do is so mesmerizing, so mind blowing. And let's start with the frog. Okay. What you right. say that you can do <laughs> is you take a, an innocent frog and in the process of you're going to explain me uh, how you're going to put its eye on the on on the tail or something like this and you have another thing that you do to the uh, harmless frog is that you can reshape its face to a Picasso shape face for example the mouse will be off here and the eyes will be like here and the nose will be so a is it true and b how do you do it uh yes yes these things are true and uh and uh, there are many other similar stories that i could tell you but but let's uh, let's discuss these two so the eye on the tail this is the work of uh, douglas blackiston who works in my lab and what we decided to ask was a simple question uh 
how how much um, you see the, the, we we started out with this idea of intelligence as being able to uh, get to the same goal despite perturbations, right? So this is our attempt to understand what is the intelligence of development. How much how much intelligence does it have? Because it's really it tends to fool you. The fact that frog eggs always make frogs and acorns always make oak trees give you this false idea that well, what else is it going to do? It can do one thing. That's all it's ever going to do. So we decided to really see um, using the only way you can judge these things is to do perturbative experiments to to make d difficulties for it and see what it does. So one thing he discovered is that if you take some cells that normally are going to become I, you physically uh, take, and this is a very early embryo, it doesn't look like anything yet, it's just a ball, it doesn't look like a, like a frog or anything like that. And from the front of it, you take some cells that we know are, are supposed to be I, and you move them to the back of the uh, the back of the embryo, and you just sort of stick them in. I mean, it's a physical surgical transplantation under a microscope with little tiny needles, you can do this. And so you move these cells to the back, and what we find out is several amazing things. First of all, even though these cells are in a crazy environment, instead of sitting next to the brain where they belong, they now are sitting next to muscle, right? So they're in a very bizarre environment, but they still make a perfect eye with all of the right components, lens, optic nerve, everything is perfect, right? Then, so that's the first thing, amazing thing. So you end up with these frogs with eyes on their tails, on their butts, uh, you know, anywhere you want. There's a, there's and the, the eye is connected to the brain. Now that's the next step. The eye does not connect to the brain. The eye puts out one optic nerve. The optic nerve sort of looks around where he's going to go. And then it connects to something, sometimes to, the, to nothing, sometimes to the gut, sometimes to the spinal cord. Okay, So it does not go all the way up to the brain. It connects to somewhere local, not too far away. Then we find out that if we do this with embryos that have no primary eyes, so we moved all of the cells, right? So there are no eyes in the head, but, but there is one eye on the tail those animals can see. How do we know that they can see? Because we built a machine that uh, gives, them, um, uh, gives them training to perform in particular color assays. So we shine different color lights on them, and then we train them to do particular things. And these, these animals train very well. They can clearly see the light. They can, they can avoid a moving light and things like this. They, they do very well. So now this tells you some amazing things. It tells you that, uh, first of all, that the plasticity of the whole system is such that we didn't need uh, a thousand generations to to evolve to adapt to this novel architecture that now your your sensory system is not connected where it's supposed to be it's connected somewhere else you didn't need uh, eons of evolution for this it immediately works right away the straight out of the box it works and it means that uh it, it has this remarkable implications for evolution because if if you're evolving a, a system where changes like this don't wreck the whole the whole business, that that really tells you something very important about how evolution is going to work. Because remember, one of the biggest problems with evolution is how do you keep prior gains? If you have a, any engineer knows that what, as, when I first, as, as, a, as a kid who built many things, when I first, first heard of the idea of evolution, that you're going to make random changes, I said, are you kidding? This is ridiculous. That is never going to work, right? As an engineer, you think you're going to make random changes in this carefully, you know, sort of working thing, forget it, it's always going to be bad. But that's because we didn't understand what we were dealing with. We, uh, unlike typical engineers, evolution doesn't deal with passive materials. It deals with what I call agential materials, and we can talk about that, meaning that they will try to get their job done even if things go wrong. So if evolution, let's say there's some kind of mutation that moves the eye to the tail, but it also does some other nice things, typically in, a, in, in another architecture, if that animal couldn't see, he would be dead. And you would never be able to explore the other consequences of that mutation. Just about every mutation would be would be very bad, harmful for the organism. But if many of these mutations are going to be um, uh, dealt with by the cells and the tissues that can still get their job done, even if things change, why then all of these mutations become either neutral or positive? Because now you have a much smoother surface to evolve. You have much you more flexibility. Much more flexibility. You don't immediately wreck the system every time you try something new. This is huge. This is this potentiates the power of evolution hugely. So that's the story of the eye on the tail. Now, just a second. Just a second. You, you, you. I, I, I actually can feel my brain getting warm. So, one. This is, from what I understand goes a little bit against the concept of Darwinian evolution, because as Darwin said, there are no jumps in nature. And what you said is that, listen, we don't need generations and generations like genetic algorithms that you need like many, many generations. We, you can make 
enormous changes, enormous uh, uh, fundamental changes in just one embryo. This is like an, it's not what Darwin meant, I think. This is one. And 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 B, in your frog example, you said, listen, if if the frog has one eye on the face, the other eye on the tail will not see. But if I, be, if I remove all the eyes from the face, the eye in the tail will be able to see. So Sorry, what is the difference? The, I didn't say the first part. So 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 every eye is going to contribute to vision. So so what we have are frogs that have no eyes in the face, none, and then one eye on the tail, and we show that they can see. Okay, but if but what what you said that if I just put some cells on the on the tail, and there will be one optical nerve, and this optical nerve will be connected to the gut or the spinal cord. Th this eye will be also functional? Oh, yeah. Th yeah, that's exactly right. That's how the animal will see, through that eye. Yeah. Okay. So from this frog, and what and what about the concept of Darwinian ev evolution? That what you, what you present, what you show here in your experiments are huge leaps. Yeah, I think that, and 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 I want to be clear. I I am not the first person to uh, show these kind of leaps. In the in the 1940s, there was uh, this phenomenon called slippers goat. There was this guy. I think he was Dutch uh, that uh, that had a goat. This goat was born without uh, arms. You know, without forearms. Right. All it had was legs. And because goats are very uh, very robust and very stubborn, he he learned to walk upright. So this goat walked walked upright. When the goat died, they dissected the goat and they found that. Uh, many of the changes that you need for bipedal locomotion, so the pelvic tilts, the backbone, all this stuff that you need was all there in this goat. No, no, you know, it normally takes, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of years from, from four-legged uh, primates to, to, to upright humans, uh, right there in this goat. So, so this phenomenon has been known for a really long time, but I think now we're starting to understand how it works. And the thing about this, this, this in no way invalidates what, what Darwin was saying. Dar it's just that um, Darwin was trying to uh, get to uh, the same uh, outcome, which is adaptive evolution. Uh, he showed how it can eventually happen with a very uh, dumb passive substrate. So, so, so if you assume no intelligence in your substrate whatsoever, you can, and we know from genetic algorithms in, in computer science, yeah, with a completely passive substrate, if you just have a big enough population and you do the kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a hill climbing If you stretching. have a goal function in genetic, I teach, I teach genetic algorithm in, in computer science, but the idea in genetic algorithms that you have the goal function all, all, way, all the way long. And yeah. evolution, according to Darwin, is local, is not global. So there is no, like, a, like a big reward function that like extract you from the future. It doesn't happen. This, and this is exactly what happens in genetic algorithm in the concept of computer science. I know where I want to go. Therefore I can take, I can extract all these modifications. Say this is a better modification than this because I have the final goal. This is tremendously different, no? Well, the, the part that they have in common is that the environment, uh, in in a way, implements these kind of uh, fitness functions, right? Because because uh, you know you can think about um, uh, the the biomechanics of the legs and insects, and you're trying to jump, and the environment will be very clear who had the nice, who had the well jumping legs, and who didn't, because it's going to kill off everybody who didn't jump correctly, right? So so there's this notion of a of a fitness function, of course, many of them simultaneously in, in the in the real world, but but the part that that this adds to evolution is an incredible speed up. And in fact, I think some minimal intelligence because when you are dealing with material that can, and in fact, I can, um, I, have a, I have a student, um, Lakshman, who recently, uh, we, we recently published an interesting uh, story on this, where uh, if you are dealing with a material that itself has competency, meaning that it's not just a passive uh, material, exactly what the genome says, that's what it does. It actually, during development, it has the opportunity to fix up some things and, you know, if things aren't quite right, it will make up for some of these defects. Then something very interesting happens. Uh, when, imagine that you have an individual and it comes up for selection and it, it's pretty good. It does a pretty good job, whatever, whatever it's doing, it does a pretty good job. Selection can't tell whether it does a really good job because the genome was amazing 
or whether it does a good job because the competency fixed up for some of the things yes. that were wrong in the genome, right? And then this becomes, as soon as uh, that happens, the, the selection has a really hard time picking the best genomes. What it can do is pick the most competent ah. individuals. So you got this crazy oh. feedback loop, right? Where now yes. more and more of the effort goes into increasing the intelligence of the system. Because and, and the more you do that, the harder it is to see the genome again. Somebody it's um, like a many many variables optimization functions that you need, you know, to modify each one of the variables, and you don't know which one of them is responsible for. The optimization function that, that's exactly right and you will never know and 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 Steve Frank gave me a, a really fun analogy from from computer hardware which is that uh, he says that as um, as uh, raid arrays became more popular you know for, for hard drives the yes. quality of the media went down because you don't need to have such great media once you have a raid array and that sort of feeds itself right but in the but but the trick is it's a one-way ratchet because once you depend on your you can't now remove your RAID array and stick with your disk because the disks are junk. And so uh, that explains some amazing puzzles in biology, including the planaria. And probably you will want to talk about this, but there are some. Yes, the two-headed planaria. But before the, pl the two-headed planaria, we needed to pay respect to the Picasso frog. Okay. Yep. So yep. we had the eye on the tail frog. And now we're going to the Picasso frog. And again, this is not CRISPR. This is not that you take the, the sequence of AGCT and you cut. This is like the face and I put the face over here. This is something Correct. completely different. You take the Correct. cells that you know somehow this is a cell of, of the mouth and you put it in a different yep. location. Yep. There are yeah, there, there are many ways to to uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk about how we did it. There there are many ways to um to 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 uh, uh, mess up this process of of craniofacial morphogenesis. The reason we did it was again that we are interested in finding intelligence in unfamiliar places. So when you look at a typical tadpole, and so the tadpole of the frog has it has the eyes, it has the jaws, the the nose, the nostrils, everything. That tadpole has to become a frog. In order to become a frog, it has to move all of those organs. So the jaws have to move forward, the eyes have to move, like everything has to move. Um, w you might think, which is from observing the process, that, well, this is probably hardwired. Every tadpole looks the same. Every frog looks the same. So every organ, it just needs to know, go three millimeters in that direction, and then I'm done, right? So so that's it. You, you might think that this whole process can be completely hardwired, and you'll go from tadpole to frog. So we wanted to test this idea because we suspected that actually this was a much more intelligent process than that. And so how do you test for intelligence? You make a perturbation and you see what the system does. So this is, was um, the work of uh, Laura Vandenberg in my group. And what she, what she did was uh, using a variety of techniques, including surgical transplantation of cells, including bioelectrical um, modifications. We'll talk about why bioelectrical, many, many, many different ways. Uh, chemicals, there are different ways to 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 make the early tadpole face be incorrect. So the jaws are over here, the eyes on top of the head, the nose is off to the side, everything is scrambled. Okay, And what we observed is that these animals largely became perfectly normal frogs because all of the organs starting in the wrong position moved different distances through different paths to end up in the correct location. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they actually have to move back a little bit. So and again, so, I, I, I just going to show something. This is like the uh, uh, the tuple is going to be a frog, and you uh, just uh, um, messed with it. And 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 our concept is that if you know, like like let's say that I'm the cell here over here, that I need I I know that I need to go four centimeters forward. But if I go four centimeters forwards in this uh, modified a version, I will be like a Picasso frog. But yeah. somehow, and you're going to explain me how, somehow these cells, these particular cells, knows that it needs to move a different length in order yeah. to compensate for the mess that you did in your laboratory. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so what we were able to show is that this is a more intelligent system than simple hardwired because it can uh, get to the same goal, the same anatomical outcome, even if you start it in the wrong starting position. So um, now, now that sounds kind of magical. How does it know? But uh, if you think about uh, very simple cybernetic devices like your thermostat. So your thermostat 
is what's interesting about it is that it does not always simply go up five degrees. What it does is it measures the current temperature, compares it to the set point, and then does whatever it needs to do to try to minimize the error, right? It's basically a, a homeostatic kind of system that tries to minimize error. And so what we started doing was investigating this process of embryonic development, of regeneration. I mean, regeneration is the same thing. If you have a salamander and you, and you uh, amputate anywhere along the length of the limb, it will regrow exactly what's necessary, and then it stops. When does it stop? It stops when a correct salamander limb is complete. I mean, this raises a very obvious question. How does it know what a correct salamander limb looks like? But not just in, in, in planaria and in, in salamandra, in a baby embryo where the cells duplicate, duplicate at the, at the tip of the fingers, somehow the cells at the tip of the fingers know, A, that they are the cells of the tip of the fingers, and they should act and behave differently than, for, for example, heart cells, and B, they know where to stop, although yes. each cell has no, uh, it's not like each cell has like the uh, uh, master plan of the human body. So, ah, I'm going over here. Yep. So, yep. And, and we know, we know that, that it cannot work that way with the master plan because it's extremely flexible. So you can take an early embryo, human, divide it into four pieces, And you don't get four chunks of a body, you get four uh, quadruplets, you get perfectly normal, healthy quadruplets. So, so you, can, you can make all kinds of crazy changes, the cells will get to where they need to go. So we started thinking about this process, uh, could we imagine the whole thing as a kind of homeostatic process, and more specifically, as a navigational process? What do I mean? What are they navigating? Well, you can imagine the space, it's a virtual space of all possible anatomical configurations. It's very hard to visualize because it's a multi-dimensional space, but, but you start as a single cell, which is here in this space somewhere, and you need to be up here eventually, which matches to a human body or a frog or whatever you're going to be, and you need to navigate along the way. And like any autonomous vehicle, part of being an intelligent navigator is, well, what happens if somebody interferes along the way? Oh, I'm started in the wrong starting position, or there's a barrier, or something is happening. How do I navigate? So we started thinking about this process, and in particular, uh, what we found was that the, the, the thing about us, well, there's, there's two interesting things about this whole weird way of thinking about it. And, this, and by, I, should, I should tell every, you know, the, the listeners, this is not the standard way of thinking about any of this. This is not the story you learn in basic developmental biology, right? This is many of the examples I talk about. They never mention these things in, in, in the typical um, course because they are, they are very difficult to explain using traditional viewpoints. And thus, uh, you know, they're sort of these, uh, these, these, these side issues that I think are actually the most important thing. So, so there are two amazing things about this kind of homeostatic model. One is that It makes a very strong prediction. It tells you that uh, somewhere there should be the set point recorded, the same way that in your thermostat you can point to, well, how does it know what is the right temperature? Well, here is recorded somehow. The, the, the set point is somehow recorded. So, so we should be able to find it. And, and then the prediction is this. If we, if we find the set point, if we decode it, and if we learn to rewrite it, then you can do the same trick you do with a thermostat, which is an amazing trick. You can change it to keep a temperature of the room to something else without rewiring the machine. It means you do not have to rewire the, physically the, the, the machine. And you don't even have to know how the machine works, really. You don't need to know every aspect of it. All you need to know is that, in fact, it is a, a homeostat. And you need to know how to change the set point. That has huge implications for regenerative medicine, because if it means that It means that if we can uh, not treat cells and tissues as a mechanical clock, where your only hope is to rewire it, the hardware level, right, with, with genetics and CRISPR and all of that, if we understand that it is, in fact, a homeostat, then you can learn to reset these set points and let the cells do what they do best, which is to, to build to that set point. And in fact, you can get that way success long before you even understand every part of the process, because you've offloaded some of the complexity onto the system itself. This is a strategy that humans have been using for, for 10,000 years. Why did we know how to uh, train dogs and horses before we knew any neuroscience? You don't have to know all the neurosciences. You have to understand what type of intelligence does your system have? What, what is the currency of learning and what, how do you interact with it? Just a second. I want to go back to your example of self-driving vehicle, uh, self vehicles that you need, you know, the 
what you said that I can think about it like a navigation al- navigation algorithm problem. Let's say, and uh, I, I specifically ask it because I teach those very subjects. Let's say that I teach a navigation algorithm like A star. I, there is a, f- and, and you said there is this cell and there is at the end, the human body and the cell need to go from here to the human body and bypass a uh, barriers. And this makes perfectly sense if I can, I can compare between this position and the human body. Yes. I, I need a reward or a penalty yes. function yes. between this position over here and the final body program over here. Yes. And yes. I didn't quite understand where is this reward function. Yep. Yeah, I haven't said it yet. So so I'm... Uh, ah, I'll, okay, I'll, okay. I'll, okay. I'll, okay, I'll, very tell, you, good. I'll <laughs> tell you now where it is. I'm just building, I'm just building up the, you know, the story piece by okay. piece. So, so, so you're exactly right. There is a reward function. And uh, now it is not a single function that takes you all the way to the end. It is a series of first you get to here, then you get to here, then you get to here, then you get to here. It's a series of changing reward functions. The reward function is this. Um, what, what we, uh, in starting to think about, okay, so where is the set point? Where is, we, we call it the, the target morphology, the encoding of what are you trying to make? You know, how many fingers you want to have and, and so on. Uh, we started to, we, I asked myself, uh, well, uh, what is an example of this? And of course, the most obvious example is the brain. In the brain, we, uh, we, we have creatures that use their brain to have a goal that they want to get to. And then they have some degree of competency of getting to that goal, maybe very smart, maybe not so smart, but they have some degrees. How does the brain encode goal states? You know, you might say, well, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, crazy. How can a bunch of cells encode uh, a, a goal? Well, that's what we have in the nervous system. If you remember, if you're a rat and you remember how to run a maze, you encode the, the structure of that maze in your brain somehow. So, so we said, well, uh, that capacity surely had to come from somewhere in evolution. It didn't just sort of arise out of nowhere. What is the primitive version of that, of that capacity? And so, so, so this is where the bioelectricity comes in. We, we've been testing for years. We've been testing this hypothesis that the electric circuitry of all of your body cells, not just the neurons, not just your brain, all of your body cells, what the electric circuitry is doing is two things. One, holding a memory of what the correct anatomy should be at any given time. And two, uh, doing the computations that compare the current state to the target state. So, so imagine now you, you have a particular configuration and you have a memory of what that configuration is supposed to be. And I'm going to tell you in a minute that we can now, we can read and write this, this encoding. So, so you have this, this electrical memory of what your shape should be. Your shape is not that, it's wrong. It's, you know, it's early, st- from, the, from the perspective of each developmental stage, the previous stage is a defect. It's wrong, yeah. From the perspective of a gastrula, if you're still a blastula, well, you're wrong. You you need that's a birth defect. You need to be repaired. And so, so what happens is that uh, there is a there is an error that gets calculated. The error, I believe, it's basically although this m- much remains to be to be found here, but I believe it's it's basically stress. It's basically cashed out a cellular, cellular stress. The error basically stresses out all the cells, and they try to minimize that stress by doing all the things they know how to do. They divide, they differentiate, they, 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 they do all these this different things. This is great. Things. This is right? great. If I agree on one and two, that it has like a memory of the final goal and a way to, this is great. But my question is, okay, one, how, how do we uh, preserve a memory of the final body, of, of the final shape? And where does this memory come from? Yeah. So okay. So so the so the first question is easier than the than the second question, but I'll I'll give you I'll give you my thoughts on both of them. Uh, what we now can do is something similar to what neuroscientists do in the brain, which is we do electrical imaging in the body. So I, we have, and this this technique was worked out by Thorley Thorlin and then Danny Adams in my group and many others, where we can take a, a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. And this is just a chemical that glows different degrees depending on the local voltage. And we put it on the embryo. And what you see is all the electrical states across the tissue. Okay? And what you can see is that long before the genes get turned on and long before the anatomy is there, you can see a pre-pattern 
of what the future shape is supposed to be. This is what Burr, Burr already said this in 1936. Burr already said this from his from his uh, measurements with a voltmeter. He could already say that. Of course, he couldn't see the whole field, but we can now we can now literally see. Uh, and so and so we've seen uh, patterns of uh, you know one pattern is uh, we call it the electric face because before the face is formed you can see where everything is going to go here the eyes are going to be here's the mouth here's the 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 placodes on the sides you can see all this in the electrical in the this electrical is what you're talking about this is what you're this, talking about this is the video that uh, so so Danny Adams made this video this is a very early one uh, meaning that it's a very th this is this doesn't have a face yet these are just um, an early frog embryo at the very initial stages of, of development. So you can but see... But here you can see the different cells that it, 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 it is just one cell, yes? Uh, no, there are about, uh, uh, in this okay. embryo, there are probably 32 cells, something like that. Okay, but you, but, but you said that in, a, in, in another video, you could see, and the green lines are the electric signals, you yep. could see that in the green lines, one can see like the shape of the face absolutely absolutely later lay about you know about 12 hours after this yes you can see you can see that and wow. and the amazing thing is and this is we should get to the planaria story because that's where it's best um, uh, described what we found out is that that electrical pattern determines where the genes are going to turn on and off they, they determine where the anatomical structures are going to be and if we reproduce those electrical patterns somewhere else in the body you can make those structures. So for example, one of the earliest things uh, my student um, Sherry Au did was to reproduce the electrical signal uh, that uh, normally tells you where the eye goes. She reproduced it on the gut of the animal. And guess what those cells did? They make an eye, of course, because this is these electrical patterns are serve as the error function to the local cells, and they will do whatever they can do to minimize that, that delta. This is literally hacking the system. Yes, this is a, literally a, hacking the system. So we correct. know what yes. you what you say is the following thing: you can record these electric uh, electric signals that uh, signals the cells to uh, to make it, to make an eye, and then play the tape of the electric signals into another place, and and the and the cells over there, for example, in the gut, knows or compute according to according to the stress how to make an eye because yes. this is a software and if you hack yes. the soft if you hack the system if you hack if you know the language yes you know you could do whatever you want yes yes that's that's exactly right and the only reason we are able to do that is because evolution uh gave us a machine that has this architecture why does why does it have this hackable architecture because that's how evolution makes the embryo in the first place. All of these cells are hacking each other all the time. They have this amazing interface on their surface, which is these ion channels, these little um, uh, uh, gates that send ions in and out that determine the voltage state, exactly like in the brain. Same, all the same me mechanisms, exactly the same. And it is uh, it is reprogrammable in exactly the same way that the nervous system is reprogrammable, meaning the exact same hardware can learn many different things depending on its history and experience. And it's it's this architecture, evolution loves this architecture because that's how you can most easily make complex uh, embryos that repair themselves and do all these kinds of things. We are just, we are, we are the second to discover this. The evolution was the first to discover all of this. And we're now, just hacking into that same interface. Before we move to the planaria, I must ask you, before I met you, I have never came across those mind-blowing uh, ideas about bioelectricity, etc. And you said uh, evolution were, was the first, we were the second. Now, without this knowledge, without this notion of bioelectricity that explains so many, so many different things, how traditional biology or traditional uh, biochemistry explain all the unexplainable things before your research? There is a difference. So, so there is a difference between explaining, and you can. So, so, so the thing is that for any phenomenon, you can always drill down to the lowest level and describe what you see at the lowest level. And you will never find magic and you will never find fairies. You will always find physics and chemistry is what you will find. 
So you Maxwell can take, equations. That's it. You will find you can you can do that at any point, and you can always drill down and you say, well, what more do you need? I see the atoms are moving, the genes are being expressed. Uh, emergence, you know, they will say that that right that there are local rules, a cellular automata, and eventually you get emergence. That's fine. Then the question becomes, okay, very good. Um, but now you want to make changes to the system, right? You want to make changes to the system. What do you tweak to make changes? And so here is my my prediction is, and this this uh, you know um, this is not uh, something that makes many people happy, but I will make this a prediction anyway. That the standard uh, paradigm ideas of uh, look, look at modern molecular medicine. Everything is focused on the hardware: CRISPR, genome editing, pathway rewiring, protein engineering. All of this stuff is down at the absolute lowest level. I think that all of these things will uh, plateau in terms of their capabilities, will plateau after you've picked all the low-hanging fruit that are easily done at the hardware level. Yeah, you can do amazing things in assembly language, sure. But at some point, uh, you know, yes. you flatten out, right? And you need to go beyond. And you need to uh, to really get the, um, uh, the promise of transformative regenerative medicine you need to exploit the beauty of your material. The material is intelligent. You can treat it as a, as a mechanical clock, sure. And you can try to program your computer with a soldering iron and some magnets. You could try that. But why when you have this beautiful interface that's much better? And again, you cannot finish the unfinished symphony using only your, your knowledge of acoustics. Yes. You need a different way, yes. a different level yes. of knowledge, of understanding Yes. which is much higher. And this is the knowledge of music. Yep. Now you can reduce in some way to a very specific part, all of music into acoustic, but it really doesn't go all the way. You can't, yes. un- you can't explain music with acoustic. By the way, I think that you cannot explain uh, of, uh, up until now, I thought that you could explain the human phenomena with biology. And I think that you still, there is much more to the human phenomenon than biology and chemistry. Well, Would yes, you agree? and I, I think that's true. And I think that uh, the, these, these other levels of description exist for a reason. I, I don't think that, uh, well, and in fact, you know, it used to be this question of reductionism, right? Do you get everything from the lowest level? It used to be a philosophical question, and people have argued about this for, for millennia. That is no longer a philosophical question. It has been answered in a rigorous mathematical way by people like uh, Giulio Tononi and Eric Hole and, and folks like that. And w- you can now calculate that in certain systems, higher levels of description literally do more work than the lower levels. It's an amazing discovery in, in, in information theory that actually you can now calculate this, uh, st- you know, strictly speaking. And I think this is... Um, this is this is uh, the this is the difference is that yeah after the fact so after I tell you that hey these things uh, are smart enough to do this and that yeah then you can drill down and see all the molecules and you say ah it was the molecules all along but that's after we did this and so and so what I always say is uh, the this is not a philosophical question this is an empirical question you have a mo- you may have a model that's in terms of molecules I may have a model that it's in terms of error minimization and goals. And let's see what the what what each of these models um, facilitates in terms of biomedical advances. We'll, we'll, we'll your find out. Ability, your ability to modify, change, and predict complex behavior is much greater than just looking, you know, in the scope of the uh, just the only m- m- molecule or the only cell or the single cell. So we must move on to the planaria. And yeah. what I know from of planaria from your research is I can cut planaria, I can paste planaria, I can control X, control V, control X, control V, and I can make planaria lives forever. So uh, let's start with cutting. How yeah. do you cut your planaria? <laughs> so yeah, so so planaria already live forever. Uh, they are immortal. They do not age as far as we can tell at the at the body level. Uh, And one of the amazing, uh, so they have many amazing properties. So, so they, they are immortal. They are highly regenerative. So you can literally, you, you put them on a piece of ice to uh, anesthetize them. And then you take a scalpel and you cut them into pieces. And within about uh, a week to 10 days, each piece will grow a perfect tiny little worm. The old part shrinks to be match, size matched to the new part. The new part grows. 
it's exactly will be an exact copy of, of the new one. Uh, this is also how they reproduce. So they by, to reproduce, they tear themselves in half and then they regenerate. And so that's how they that's how they reproduce. And uh, two more amazing things. One is that, and this was first discovered by McConnell in the 60s, and he got a lot of uh, flack for it, but he was absolutely right. Uh, if you train a planarian in a particular task, and then you cut off their head, which contains their brain, the tail will eventually regrow a new head and a new brain, and it will remember the original information. So there's this movement of learning information between the brain and the body, and then back onto a new brain. So... Uh, so there's that. And then the final thing is this, which kind you of gets say, us... Just a second. You say it. You say so unbelievable thing in a very, you know, peaceful way. If you cut the tail, the brain will, uh, the, the tail will develop a new brain with all the... What? <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you have like... A... How do you, uh, uh, leave me, how do you explain it to yourself? How do you explain this wonder based on your uh, understanding in uh, biology and chemistry and physics and all the knowledge that you have? How do you explain it to yourself that it will grow with the memories of the brain? How? The only... So we, no one knows. Okay, so it's so this is a big mystery, and 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 we do not know. Um, the only thing that we know for sure are two things. One, that information that you learn is in, at least in that animal. I'm not sure what happens in in mammals, for example, but in in that animal, what you learn is not strictly in the brain. That much is clear. And two, wherever else it is in the body, it is able to be imprinted onto the new brain so that it can control behavior correctly. That is all that we know. We literally have no idea. Well, I mean, other people have studied the transfer of memory. For example, David Glantzman uh, studies uh, transfer of memory by taking RNA from the brain of a learned sea, uh, from a trained sea slug, and he shoves it into the brain of a new sea slug, and he shows that you can transfer some memories this way. So there's some work on this, but but we we don't know. I have no idea how this works in planaria. We we just don't know. Okay, so we take the planaria, and I can stitch together two. a uh, two head so I, i i can make a two head planaria but there's no stitching so there's no stitching uh, okay so, so so what we do is so so here's the here's the thing uh when you cut a planarian so 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 you have a tail a middle and a head and you cut it in two you, you make two cuts so you remove the tail you remove the head and now you have this middle fragment with the your permission i'm taking this from chris but this That's is chris it. with you so i yeah. i i am allowing myself so this is a planaria And yep. I'm making two cuts. This is one yep. cut and this is the other cut. And we, exactly. and, and we see the heads only the head only here. Yeah, so, so, so what we're going to track is the middle fragment. Let's look at the middle fragment. Okay. The, nope, this not that one. thing. The, that's it. That's it. That's it right there. The okay. middle fragment. So now in order to regenerate, this, this little fragment has to remember how many heads am I supposed to have and where do these heads go? It could go up at the top, it could go at the bottom. How do I know where it goes, right? So if you listen on Spotify, please switch to YouTube now. You must, you must see it. Yes, please. <laughs> please, Michael, continue. <laughs> um, so so this, this fragment of tissue has to make that decision of uh, how many heads am I going to grow and where do these heads belong? So we hypothesized, and this was the first person to do this in my group was Wendy Bean. And what she did was she used a voltage-sensitive dye to ask the question, can we find the electrical pattern memory that tells you how many heads you're supposed to have? And this is really, look, if, if I, I make the claim that the, uh, any kind of uh, morphogenesis or development, um, uh, remodeling, uh, regeneration is the behavior of a collective intelligence of cells in this uh, anatomical morpho space that we talked about, right? There's this collective intelligence, just like we are a collective intelligence of neurons. There's a collective intelligence and it has to make decisions in this space. So by looking at the bioelectrics, we are reading the mind of this collective intelligence, exactly how neuroscientists try to read the mind of, of, you know, of, of animals with brains. So we looked for this electrical pattern. Sure enough, we found one. Uh, there's an electrical pattern and you're seeing it here that says one head, one tail. The red portion tells you one head and the blue portion tells you one tail. 
Yeah. So I, I'm pointing now, this is one head and this is one tail. So yeah. it it should, you know, make from, from this middle plane area, it should grow on the top head on the bottom tail. Exactly. Exactly. But, so, but, but having seen this, we can say, okay, I'm going to rewrite this set point. I'm going to reprogram that memory into a different memory. I'm not going to touch the DNA, just like you do not touch the wires of your thermostat when you reset it. I believe that this is a goal-directed homeostatic system. I believe it's using this voltage to know what to build, and I'm simply going to rewrite it. Now, how do we rewrite it? Well, the voltage is there because of the action of these ion channels that pass potassium, sodium, chloride, protons, and so on. And so what you can do is you can, with a computer model, you can ask, um, how do, which ones of these do I need to open or close in order to make the pattern be different? So literally, you're literally interacting with, we call this the bioelectric code, the idea that if we understood which channels and pumps to turn on and off, we could make that pattern be whatever we want. So, so you open and close channels in order for the blue one to be uh, to look like the red one, and then you exactly. get the two-headed wall. Exactly. Or exactly. the red one to look like the blue one, and then you get no head wall. Exactly. Because these... Now, why does it work? It works because... And, and both of these have completely normal hardware. There's nothing wrong with the genome, the cells, everybody's... All the cells are exactly wild-type cells. The reason it works is because this is not a hardwired system. This is a system in which the cells will, will build whatever the pattern says. So now, what can we build? We can build two headworms. We can build no headworms. We can even build now worms with heads of the wrong species of planarian, because there are other species that have triangular heads or flat heads or round heads. We can make them build these other species because the cells are very happy to build whatever the electrical pattern says. So this is the example. You know, we talked in the beginning about how do we how do we know any of this is true? Because you can literally see the memory, you can rewrite the memory, and then you can uh, you can see that the cells will the exact same cells will build. Now the most you, amazing part and you discovered another thing that if you cut the two-headed planaria, what 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 will happen? Hmm. So I keep calling this thing a pattern memory. Now, what's the most important thing about a memory? The most important thing about a memory is that it's not only rewritable, but it's stable. So that once you rewrite it, it stays where you put it. So what we found was now, now this is really interesting. This is this goes back to our our, our discussion of uh, uh, explanation versus uh, pre pre uh, you know sort of pre invention. Um, two headed planaria were first seen around 1903. Okay, that's somewhere around there was the first time anybody saw for because you can make them and there are other ways to, to make them. As far as I know, in that whole time until we, we did it for the first time in like 2008, something like that. Um, uh, Larissa Wozniak was a student in my group who, who, I, who I asked to recut these guys. As far as I know, nobody had done it in that whole time because it was pretty obvious. Everybody thought it was pretty obvious what would happen. The genetics are normal. You got rid of the second head. Well, then, of course, it should go back to normal and be a normal worm. That's not at all what happens. That memory, that electrical memory stays. So when you take a two-headed worm and you cut off the heads, and uh, that electrical circuit will still say two heads, and the piece will build two heads for, forever, as far as we can tell. You can keep cutting them and cutting them and cutting them. They will always make two heads. And so, so you can imagine... The electrical modification that you did you know, making two red, uh, two red things, just it preserve. It's like a, it's like a register. It preserves yes. the electrical yes. state, yes. and then, and then, if I cut the two head, it will produce another two head. And yes. if I cut the no head worm, it will produce another no head worm. Yes. Ah, uh, that's actually, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to swear to that because I don't remember if we ever recut the two, the no head worms. I don't remember. I may, maybe we did that. I, I, I don't know that for sure. I know, I know we, we focused most of our effort on the, on the, on the two head worms. Um, and you can sort of imagine this amazing scenario where I can take an, oh, oh, and, and of course the way they reproduce is they tear themselves in half. And when they tear themselves in half, you still get a two headed worm. So I could take these worms, I could throw them in the in the Boston, uh, in the Charles River here. And 100 years later, some scientists will come, they'll scoop up some worms, they'll say, oh, a single headed form and a double headed form. Cool, it's a speciation event. 
Let's sequence the genomes and see what led to the speciation event. Nothing. There's nothing wrong with their genomes. Their genomes are exactly the same because it is not a hard, hardware level problem. So you can ask a philosophical question. Uh, what determines the number of heads in a planarian? You can sort of say the DNA because under normal conditions, the DNA produces an electrical circuit that has a default behavior, very stable. The, the default behavior is to say one head. And under those conditions, you make one head. It's like you buy a calculator and every, you buy a thousand calculators, you turn them on, all of them say zero by default. When you turn on the juice, they all say zero. It's a very reliable circuit. Yes, but, but there was a programmer who said, say zero. You, that's the next, if, so we'll, we'll get to that momentarily. If you, if you reject the concept of the of exter external programmer, the question remains. And the question is even bigger because two-headed planaria is an unstable situation for, for the planaria, but nevertheless, the planaria keep being a two-headed in after cutting and cutting and cutting again. So this is very strange. Yeah. Well, that's not the only thing. So, so I'll, so I'll tell you a story about, um, about uh, what, what, how, how really strange it is. It's even, it's even stranger than that. Uh, what, 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 one interesting thing about these planaria is that because they often reproduce by tearing themselves in half and regenerating, it means that unlike us, you see in, 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 in most animals, if you get a mutation in your body, your children don't inherit that mutation. Right, the soma is disposable. The body is sort of disposable, and the children come from the egg. In planaria, many species of planaria, this isn't true. If you make a mutation that doesn't kill the stem stem cell that it's in, it will make multiple copies and it will refill the rest of the animal. And so, so for four hundred million years, these guys have accumulated mutations. They, in fact, to the point where they uh, every cell can have a different number of chromosomes. It's called being mixoploid. They look, they look like a tumor genetically. They look like a tumor because every cell has all this crazy stuff. And yet, so, so think about this. What a scandal this is that I, that I never heard this once in, in all of the you know, developmental cell biology classes that we talked about the genome and how important it is. Never heard once the idea that the animal with the worst genome, with the, with the craziest genome, has the most robust anatomical control, fully regenerative, cancer resistant, no aging, perfect anatomy. What? How is this possible? How is this? How is this possible that 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 the worst genome? And so, this drove me crazy for years, for for decades actually. And only in the last year, I think we now have some understanding of what's going on here. And what's going on here is related to a story that we started talking about, which is that when you are dealing with a material that has a little bit of a of a ability to make up for defects whether they be physiological defects and i have i have some amazing stories to tell about that with anatomical defects whatever evolution ends up may, having there's a there's a feedback loop which means that evolution ends up making improvements in the algorithm because it can't see the genetics very well and the mo the more this happens if you take this all the way to its logical conclusion you end up with an animal like planaria where all the effort went into making an algorithm that makes a beautiful planaria no matter what the genetics looks like so so this explains right so so what you have here is is basically an animal where the algorithm has been uh, is selected for the ability to repair even when your pieces have a lot of junk in them and uh, that explains one one really bizarre fact about planaria uh, every other animal that we know of uh, uh, um, fruit flies, uh, chickens, humans, uh, you can find mutant lines. So there are albino, um, uh, you know, albino mice and flies with weird curly wings and humans with different, uh, you know, genetic whatevers uh, that you can, you can get these lines in planaria. There are no mutant lines. No one has a weird line of planaria except our two headed form. And ours isn't genetic. There are no genetic lines. Now, why is that? People have been trying this for uh, many decades to make transgenic worms, to do mutagenesis, it doesn't work. And I think the reason it doesn't work is because the algorithm is optimized by evolution to ignore defects in the hardware. It's unreliable computing at its, uh, at its uh, you know, at its You ultimate. can't mess the planaria. You can't, you, you just can't mess the planaria because the algorithm is so strong. Uh, you can you uh, the only way to do it is to is to really hack the algorithm itself, which is what we did to make the two headed forms. But but other than that, for, as far as uh, genetic defects, uh, there are no transgenic lines of planaria. There are no mutant lines. Wow. 
which leads me, I think, to the most obvious question. What can we learn from planaria? Because we, I, I, obviously, as human beings, we are not planaria. So how can I take all the knowledge that you have about planaria and this, I, I, this massive robustness and say, yeah. okay, how can we imply or, or, or apply some of those things to human beings and to cure diseases, for example? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the good news is that uh, these amazing tricks, specifically uh, the multi-scale competency architecture, this idea that, that the cells are not passive components, but they're trying to implement goals, is extremely ancient. It goes back all the way to our unicellular ancestors, to microbes. And in fact, bacterial uh, biofilms, this is, this is amazing work by um, uh, uh, Gurul Suell uh, in California, looking at how bacterial biofilms have brain-like electrical activity. So evolution discovered that electricity is good for scaling intelligence all the way at the time of bacterial biofilms, not, uh, not us, not uh, you know, mammals, all the way back. This stuff is incredibly well conserved. So that means that all of the same uh, tools and principles that we use in these so-called lower animals, so in planaria, in frog, in mouse, all of these things are... Uh, like, very likely to be directly applicable to, to us. So we have, and, and I have to do a disclaimer because uh, David Kaplan and I have a, have a company called Morphoceuticals Inc. where we are trying to uh, do this for biomedicine. So, you know, uh, this is my, uh, my commercial disclaimer here. Uh, I really think that all of these technologies, not just the bioelectrics, but the idea, the specific idea of repairing from a high level, not by micromanaging these things, but by communicating with the cellular intelligence, really, I mean, this is not, you know, new, new age metaphors. This is, I mean, I think it's, it's literally true that what we are doing here is we are sending signals to a collective intelligence to uh, convince it to move in that morphous space the way we want it to move. And this is for, for I, I, there are just, there are two very simple examples. When we induce the eye on the, uh, on the gut of a frog, we didn't have to give all the information about how to make an eye. We don't know how to make an eye. The eye has dozens of different cell types. We have no idea how to do that. What we did was a very simple subroutine call. It was a very low information content electrical signal that just says build an eye here. That's it. We don't have to know all the details because the cell, the, the collection of cells already knows how to do this by following this particular, um, um, trying to reduce the error to this particular representation. In the frogs, when we, uh, when we make a fro adult frogs regenerate their legs, which frogs, adult frogs normally don't do that. Salamanders do it and frogs don't do it. We did it by a uh, stimulus at the wound that lasts for 24 hours. The treatment lasts for 24 hours. The leg grows for 18 months after that. During those 18 months, we don't touch it. So this is not 3D printing. This is not micromanaging gene expression. This is not putting stem cells where you want them to go. It's nothing like that. It's communicating to the collective all the way upstream what they should be doing. And if we understand the language, then that's, bio, that's the road to biomedicine. Like I told my viewers, we started with the science fiction and then we move on to the more science fiction and to the more science fiction. Now, don't give away any commercial secrets, but how this process is going to be. Let's say that I'm going to be treated with bioelectricity. So I have two questions. One, how do you record those signals? And two, how do you play them? Are you going to electrify me with like a... What the process is going to be like? And yeah. how do you... And let's say that you need to inject this electrical signal into the stomach or can you... I can hear... What is going to to be the procedure? Okay, um, so so a few things. Uh, we don't use any applied electrical fields. We don't use electrodes, fields, no waves, no magnets, no, no, nothing like that. What we do is we are going to uh, open and close the native ion channels that control the electrical. It's we're going to use the native interface, so the keyboard, as it were, of these tissues. They already give us a beautiful interface. We don't need to do, do anything else other than control this interface. The key to all of this is a computational platform that we're developing that, and we've already used it. We've had uh, success repairing uh, brain defects and cancer normalization and some other stuff where what you can do is you can compute 
which channels need to be open or closed to move the electrical pattern to the way that you want to move it. Now, the way you, you apply it is this. So, so our current applications is for limb regeneration. So somebody loses a limb, what happens? Uh, and we've done this in, in frog, and now we're doing this in, in mice. Uh, what happens is that you put on this thing. It's a wearable bioreactor that's made by David Kaplan's group. Uh, it has a little bit of silk gel inside. And inside that silk gel are some drugs, which we call electroceuticals, that are specifically targeting different ion channels that we have computed need to be open or closed to tell the cells at the wound, don't scar, remake whatever goes here normally, which is a normal limb. So that's, that's what it's going to look like. Now, I will also point out that uh, you, you mentioned the stomach. I will also say that one of the things that we've been discovering in all of these experiments is that bioelectrical information is highly non-local, meaning that when we fix the brain, for example, in the frog, we can do it from cells in the belly, uh, from the opposite side of the embryo. Because, and I guess it should be no surprise, electrical networks are very good at integrating across space, right? So we found that you do not need uh, to necessarily treat the exact same cells that you're trying to reach. The system integrates information from very far away in the body. So, so I don't know, you know, in the case where there's a, there's a problem deep inside, I'm not even sure that we're going to have to go there directly. I think you might be able to treat at a surrogate site. We, we've done that with cancer, for example. We make tumors on one side of the tadpole, and we treat them from with using either optogenetics or various other ion channel modulators on the other side of the animal, on, on the opposite side of the body. I, 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 I just in awe. So just a second. In mice, you just cut the arm, and they put like like a gel, and the and and the place keep growing the leg. To be to be to be super clear, we have not yet published this working in mice. Okay, so with these experiments have just been started. We are, I mean, it's kind of obvious after the frog, you go to mammals. So yes. we are going in mice. What we have published so far is so the thing that for sure works is that you can do this in an adult frog. In an adult frog that normally never regenerates his leg, you, you after the amputation, you put on the bioreactor, it stays on for 24 hours, and then for 18 months, it regrows a, a leg with toes, and it can be feeling at the end, and then it can stand on the leg, everything like that. The, the next and step is mice, but I'm not claiming we have done this in mice. No, yet. no, 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 no. But, but would you... It, it's... And do you think it will be also be, be applicable to amputation at, in human beings? Do you mean mutation or do you mean injury? No, that, that, yes, in injury that I put the, the gel and the hand will regrow itself, regenerate itself. Uh, my, my personal opinion is that Your eventually... personal belief, yes. My personal opinion, and I cannot tell you how, how much time this will take because I don't know, but my personal opinion is that, yes, it's going to work. There is no reason it can't work. Uh, deer, deer, every year, you know, deer, you know, the big yes. adult mammals, every year they yes. regrow their antlers, right? D bone, vasculature, innervation, uh, like, like a meter of, of uh, every year. There is absolutely no reason mammals couldn't do this. We need to find the right trigger. And we need to find the right supportive apparatus, so some kind of a microenvironment that will make this uh, possible. Um, I, I believe it's going to work. Uh, 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 you made me speechless. Basically, you just made me speechless. It, it's so... Wow, the complexity. And you know, I'm, I'm in the field of computer science in artificial neural net, and we always say, Yes, artificial neural net, it's like the neurons, but it is not like the, the human neuron because no, the no. human neuron is so much more complex, it's so much more adaptive. And yeah. this is goes back to one of the things that you said, why robots don't have cancer. Because again, in robots, we have passive, passive, uh, passive parts that combine to something more intelligent. But in human beings or in any living creature, the the uh, the elementary parts are also very intelligent, and like you say, intelligence in the in the cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not just neurons. Every every cell, every tissue in your body has some degree of competency to solve problems in different spaces. 
in, in transcriptional spaces, in physiological spaces, in morphological spaces. All of them have this kind of intelligence. And uh, ca cancer is what happens when that breaks down and, and you have uh, autonomy of, of lower level units that decide to go off and have a different uh, agenda. But, but the good news is that it makes this, the whole structure incredibly robust. And uh, you know, if, if you think that it's um, science fiction to regenerate the limbs, I will point out one other thing, which is that in frog, the signal to regenerate the leg and to regenerate the tail in the tadpole is exactly the same. Meaning that we don't even have to, not only don't we have to provide the details of how to do it, we don't just really regenerate, just go, regenerate, build whatever normally goes here. That's what we are really telling it. Build whatever normally goes here. And so and I think, and can we also say stop regenerating in cancer cells? We've done it in the frog. We've done it. And we're now doing it in human glioblastoma uh, tissues. So yeah, no, you absolutely can. Now, now to, 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 to clarify, we are not telling the cells grow or don't grow. What we are telling the cells is connect together into a nice electrical network and remember what you're supposed to be doing. And when they do that, what the tissue remembers is, oh, yes, we were some nice skin or some nice muscle or whatever we were. Whereas before that, they're basically amoebas that treat the rest of the body as outside environment. Which leads, I think, to the concept of collective intelligence. And many people say, and you said yourself, that we treat ant colony as collective intelligence. But... We said, listen, collective intelligence are in everywhere. So could you please elaborate on the concept of collective intelligence in, in the context of cells and human beings? Yeah. Um, the, the fundamental fact is that, to my knowledge, there is no such thing anywhere as an indivisible intelligence that, can, that is not made of parts. Everything is made of parts. So now the question is, isn't it amazing? I mean, we are a walking bag of neurons and other cell types. Isn't it amazing that these cells who have little tiny local agendas, right? They, they have preferences about metabolic states, about physiological states. But when they get together, they acquire preferences that are huge. So, so all of your little tiny neurons get together and they have opinions about the world financial markets and, 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 and you know, the, the, the fate of mankind after the sun burns out. You know, they have these enormous goals that are unfathomable to the individual and so uh, to the individual self and so and I the have world this... emergence doesn't solve anything it's just no. a world that you know just shut up emergence yeah. this is basically yeah. the meaning of this world shut yeah. up yeah. you emergence there is much more to be done and we have I, I i have put out a very specific theory of how cognition scales so how you take little tiny um, uh, homeostats that care about little tiny local things and how connecting them together allows you to be an, a being, an emergent being that has a much bigger, so, 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 what I, so I call this the cognitive light cone. The cognitive light cone is a notion of what is the scale of the largest goal that you can pursue. Not how far you can see and how far you can sort of sense, but what is the largest goal that you can pursue. So if the largest thing you care about is the local glucose concentration, well, you're probably a bacterium. And if you have, you know, 10 minutes of memory behind and maybe five minutes of anticipation forward, so you have this tiny spatiotemporal light cone, maybe you're some kind of bacteria. If you're a dog, you know, you can have quite a long memory back, you can have some predictive capacity forward, you are never going to care about what happens in three months, 10 miles over. You just can't, that, that's, that goal is too big for you. If you're a human, you can have enormous goals, planetary scale goals, about things that will happen long after you're dead. So, so we have this amazing th fact, and maybe it gives rise to some psychological pressures actually, that, that you can envision goals that are absolutely unachievable. You know, uh, the simpler organisms, all their goals are achievable because they're shorter than their lifespan. So you can achieve all your goals. The humans, you may have goals that are enormous. And um, so, so the trick for all of this is to cash out how it is that you scale goal directedness, how, how you connect uh, cybernetic systems with tiny little goals to get systems with much bigger, uh, much bigger goals. And that's what, that's what all of this is about. <clears throat> and again, one can, th one, if I go, you know, top down approach and I say, okay, I start with a big goal and then I divide and divide and divide. 
then I can explain each neuron going to do the very same exact tiny, tiny, tiny thing. But they can't go the, uh, the other way around. They can't start in the single neuron and then move up, up to the giant goal that will happen after I did. So, so it, it is very tricky. And how can you explain this very, this single, single neuron acting in part of, you know, decision-making for the world financial crisis? Well, of course, the single, the single neuron isn't doing that. Uh, what's happening is that you have a larger system that is bending the action space. It's bending the, the, the energy landscape for all of its parts to get the parts to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. That's kind of the whole point of, of, of this collective action is to, is to get the parts to do things that by themselves they're not going to do. And so you have this, it's, we're, we're back to this idea of you look at the computer and you say, ah, it's doing an algorithm to calculate uh, you know, pi. And then you look down and you say, but this electron here, what, what, what makes this electron do go from here to there to help to calculate the pi, right? It's, uh, it, we have many examples of this where you have these like, um, uh, this, this, this scaling of, 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 of levels. And that's the trick in biology to understand how it happens in biology. And then to use that to develop new technologies that, uh, that achieve uh, uh, intelligence in, in, that, in that way, in a multi-scale architecture. And can, and can we say that the single neuron somehow knows through backpropagation and, you know, a penalty and reward that his, his actions are part of a bigger goal? That's, that's a really interesting question. So, so how, how do you, if, if you are part of a bigger system, how do you know that? Um, I suspect, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I suspect that uh, some kind of Gödel theorem limitation is going to say that we can never really understand the mind of which we are part, okay, the bigger system, that we can never really understand it. But I bet that there are techniques from, let's say, information theory or something like that, that can help you gather evidence to the fact that you are part of such a system. So I, I have this, um, um, yeah, I have this uh, sort of fantasy of imagine you're a, you're a neuron inside a brain. Actually, there's, there's two neurons, and the one neuron says to the other neuron, I think our universe is a cold, unfeeling uh, place of zero agency. Uh, it's just physics. No one cares what we do. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just this, this, this cold mechanical universe. The other neuron says, I disagree. I think I can, I can sort of feel that the universe has a, there's a mind to this. We live in a, in a mindful universe where some things are, are, are rewarded and punished. Um, and, and every time there's this sort of like, like wave of, of corrective propagation, I feel that the universe is not indifferent to what we do. I think we, we you know, I, I, so, so I can't tell if it likes cats or dogs or what this neural net is trying to do, but, but I have this, this feeling that, that, that the agency of my environment is not zero. And in the case of the neurons, of course, the second neuron is correct because, because even though he cannot comprehend everything that that brain is doing, he does not live in a mindless universe. He's part of this thing, this, this, this giant mind, right? So of course, you know, we meet people, some people feel that they live in a, uh, in a cold mechanical universe and other people feel they learn lessons, right? The universe is teaching me a lesson and I've learned it, you know, it likes me to do this and that. Uh, I, I don't know what the answer to that is and I'm not sure we can prove it, but I think it would be a big mistake to assume that we are necessarily, uh, that the agency of our environment is necessarily zero, you know? Wow, it's not, it's not biology, it's not philosophy, it's even not philosophy, it's, I think it's theology. So the, the, the idea of meaning and purpose. So, Michael Levine, thank you so much for thank your you so time. Much. And it's not just for your time, it's for your uh, groundbreaking research and what you do. And I think I, I, it's like I, I ask you about what do you hope, what do you believe? I believe that I'm talking with a future Nobel laureate. And I think that this is so mesmerizing. And say, uh, thank you so much. I always ask my guest, and I, I must ask you, 
could you give me just one single productivity tip because what you do in your lab the lab in lab produce so much valuable work so if you can share with me just one single productivity tip that you use I will appreciate it very much okay um, here's one uh, one thing that uh, I, I tell my students uh, and postdocs um, I think it's very important to clearly separate uh, creative work from mechanical work and the specifically what that means is uh, mm -hmm. let's say let's say let's say you're going to write a paper and many people are stuck uh, because because they have many ideas and they're trying to write it down and you have to keep changing it so what I do uh, is is the following I have a creative phase where I think about what do I want to say what is my story how do I want to wh whatever after that I make an outline and And then after that, my goal is to, to I, so I go, as, as a computer scientist, you'll understand what I'm saying, I go breadth first, always breadth first. So the first thing I do is put in an outline that, is, that matches my creative vision of how I want to tell the story. After that, it gets a little more mechanical because each big point of the outline, well, it's kind of clear what has to go under that. The next step is even more mechanical. And if you do that properly, you, you lose, by, by the time you get to the bottom of that outline, there is no more degrees of freedom left. You know exactly what goes in. Now it's total mechanics. You just type in whatever the outline says, that's what you put in. And so by separating the, the process where, where it's, it's uh, you know, sort of intuitive and creative and all that from the process where, okay, now I can see exactly what has to go here, you, you end up not getting stuck, right? And, and, and so, so that's, I, I try to be very clear that way and, and that, that helps me get things done. This is great. And the mechanical Michael Levine is part of the collective creative Michael Levine, which is our topic of the conversation today. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you and keep on your very important work that, that, that you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the conversation. It was great fun. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, Michael. Thank you so much. much. Appreciate it. On this channel, you will see the authors of these books and many more having great conversations with me. Please subscribe, hit the bell button, and be part of this great community. See you in the next video.